Hello again, everybody. This is Craig Evans of Autism Hangout, and thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Ask Dr. Tony Show, where Dr. Tony Atwood answers your questions about autism. Hello, Dr. T. It's always good to see you. It's always good to see you, Craig. We have some great discussions, and once again, we have some wonderful questions to go through today. Okay, let's dig right in. The first one is managing compulsive behaviors. Hi, Dr. Tony. I wanted to reach out to you to seek help for a friend of mine. He's 25 years old, and he's been discovered to be on the autism spectrum level one. He has a compulsiveness to spend on high-value gadgets, and also doesn't seem to be able to understand the importance of good financial practices. This behavior puts a lot of stress on the family who are supporting him. We would be very grateful if you could provide some insights to help manage his behavior. Mm. This is not a unique problem. Uh, And as a clinician, there are different levels uh, of explanation, and I'll go through each of them. Those who know this person can see which ones are effective, and um, I'll go through some strategies for each one. What it seems is that this behavior is almost an addiction. Um, There is pleasure with each purchase. Now, the person may have limited enjoyment in their life, but this is a thrill that is superior to anything else. And that thrill is very appealing and almost an addiction. But there's another element that it could be a compulsion, um, a means of reducing anxiety. It's almost an expression of obsessive compulsive disorder. I have to do it to reduce anxiety. It's what we call retail therapy. Also, there may be elements of ADHD. It's impulsive. He can't resist it. He doesn't think he has to get it. So there may be signs of ADHD. But also not considering the context, the cost and perception of family members. It, it's almost as though the person is in their own world. They're not seeing the consequences for them, for others and also for their own bank account. Now, if it is an addiction, uh, you could and you have a choice here, have limited or controlled access. In other words, you set a budget or abstinence. You can't do it anymore. Now, many of those who have that addiction will find abstinence very difficult to tolerate. So there may be an acceptance of having a clear budget, but an explanation why you need to do that. Now, if it's anxiety, uh, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, it would be cognitive behavior therapy and medication. Now, if it's impulsive, certainly screen for ADHD and medication for ADHD might help in that situation. But also the context and perception of the family needs to be explained to that person. We often will uh, have a piece of paper and draw it, different people's perspectives. Rather than just words, we need pictures. And that may include uh, flow diagrams, all those sorts of components. to to explain that the reason this is being done is not as a punishment, it's not something that is being uh, mean to that person, but it's for the benefit of themselves and others to give a rationalization for why this is occurring. Mm -hmm. And we live in such a capitalist world where everybody's screaming about buy now. So, yeah, this is something that needs to be addressed. Speaking of ADD and ADHD, dear Dr. Tony, I am a 50-year-old lady from the beautiful Isle of Man who has suffered my whole life and only now found the confidence to seek assessment for ADHD and or ASD. Please, can you speak more about the connection between them and how to live with both? Thank you. She's right. The Isle of Man is beautiful. Um, Not many people internationally would know the Isle of Man. It's off the Lake District in uh, Britain. And I've been there and it's a magnificent place. So uh, you're very lucky to be there. However, one of the issues of nice places to live may be a lack of resources. More on that in a moment. Now, up to 70% of autistic individuals also have ADHD. The two tend to go together. We're now looking at whether there is a particular subtype of autism plus ADHD that has a particular profile. Now, first of all, um, as a woman, I would suggest looking at the screener, the questionnaire for autistic women on my webpage, tonyatwood.com.au. Uh, fill in that questionnaire if you have a score above a certain point. 
means that a diagnosis is probably going to be confirmed at a formal diagnostic assessment. Now, you need to seek a clinician uh, experience in diagnosing autistic women. On the Isle of Man, beautiful scenery, but a lack of resources. You may have to go to the mainland and find someone who can do that for you. Now, there is actually an ADHD female profile. We've known about ADHD in men. Now, if you're looking for resources, there's an excellent new book just come out called ADHD Girls to Women by a Swedish lady, Lotta Borg Skoglund. I'm not sure how I pronounced that right. It's been published by Jessica Kingsley Publishers in the last few days. And uh, ADHD women are usually inattentive rather than hyperactive, but JKP have a lot of books on that uh, topic. Now, if the person wants to take further uh, exploration of autism and ADHD with my friend and colleague, Dr. Michelle Garnett, at atwoodandgarnetevents.com. We recently did a half-day, three-hour presentation on autism and ADHD, how the two combine. So go to that web page. You can download it, watch it, get some background information. Now, the good news about ADHD is there can be medication to help that. So um, enjoy your discovery. The next category is developmental versus mental disorder. Hello, Dr. Tony. Can you please explain the difference between developmental disorder and mental disorder? If autism means that wiring in the brain is different, are you saying it's biological rather than mental or psychological? So does autism belong in the realm of physical disabilities like birth defects rather than psychology or psychiatry conditions? It seems like that would change many of our views for understanding treatment, acceptance, and accommodations. What a great question. It is, and there's almost an historical reply to that. The way we view autism now is as a neurodevelopmental condition rather than disorder. That is, it's involving the wiring of the brain. Now, that wiring may have been affected by genetics, circumstances, a whole range of things could have occurred. So it's a neurodevelopmental disorder or condition, um, not, a, not a mental disorder such as psychosis. Um, now, the thing is that the term um, psychiatric or uh, mental disorder is historical because way back in the 1940s, 50s, when autism was first described, the main theme at the time was that autism was an expression of childhood schizophrenia or childhood psychosis. And so it became the preserve of psychiatrists. And as such, the Diagnostical and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders from when it began in 52, a recognized autism in 1980, but it was viewed as childhood psychosis. Um, and in that manual, the, the approach is this is something to be cured. Um, this is now being questioned, and I agree with that. I think the, autism should not be in a psychiatric manual. I, I think that's very inappropriate. It needs to be defined so the person can have self-understanding and support. But I think that's the issue. What we need is support accommodations, acceptance, that is self-acceptance and acceptance by others, guidance in achieving and maintaining friendships and social abilities, and environmental accommodations, such as sensory sensitivity. It's not something to be cured, it's to be understand, understood and supported. So historically, it's in a, should we say, a manual of mental disorders, but I don't see it as a mental disorder. I'm hoping that in the future, it'll be taken out of DSM. Whether it'll be in DSM-6, I don't know. I think there's a strong argument to have it removed. I think there's a lot of people feeling the same way. <laughs> All right, the next question is about ASD versus BPD disorder, borderline. So how would you know if you have both ASD 
and borderline personality disorder? Oh, another goody question. As a diagnostician, um, I'm seeing more and more women coming for a, a diagnostic assessment. Now, often they've talked to <clears throat> um, medical specialists, psychiatrists and psychologists uh, who have identified characteristics consistent with borderline personality disorder. And there are diagnostic criteria. Now, what I'm going to do is go through those criteria, but with a reflection of experience of autism. Now, once again, DSM-5 has diagnostic criteria for BPD, borderline personality disorder. Now, there are nine diagnostic criteria and you need five. Now, the first one is frantic efforts to avoid real or imagined abandonment. Now, the problem in autism is that the person may make friends, but it ends. There are various reasons the friendship will be ended by the other person and the autistic individual feels abandoned. What did I do wrong? Uh, they, they just disappeared. It, it can be really distressing for them not to understand why it's ended and fear the abandonment will occur again. Number two, unstable and intense interpersonal relationships. Yes, in autism, the intensity is important. In, in often I find in autism, it's either too intense and they wear their welcome out because they don't know the conventions or they don't contact somebody out of sight, out of mind for several months and the friend thinks the relationship is over or the friendship is over. So a part of autism is not judging the right intensity for the friendship. Number three is identity disturbance, unstable uh, self-image or sense of self. Again, in autism, the concept of who you are has been affected by rejection and criticisms and so on. You have great difficulty with self-reflection, determining the concept of self. Number four is impulsivity in areas that are potentially self-damaging. If you've got autism and ADHD, you're going to be impulsive. Recurrent suicidal behaviors, gestures, threats, self-mutilating. Yes, in autism, you can have self-harm. It can be soothing. It can be physical pain to block uh, emotional pain. It can be to connect with your body. It can be self-hatred. But self-harm in autism, especially for teenage girls, is very common. Number six, affective, that is emotional instability. Yes, emotion regulation problems is a part of autism. Chronic feelings of emptiness. Yes, your life is not as fulfilling as other people. Inappropriate intense anger. Yes, a major problem in autism is anger management. Number nine is transient, self-related, paranoid ideation or severe dissociative symptoms. You can get that paranoid ideation because it's true. People are mean and horrible to you. Uh, and dissociation is your way of coping in part because of trauma. So you can see how a diagnostician may <clears throat> consider borderline personality uh, disorder. Now, the thing is with BPD, it can be associated with a childhood history of abuse and trauma. And we are recognizing a lot of trauma in the life experiences of autistic individuals. What matters is the person's ability to cope, not necessarily the severity of the incident and how much it has been repeated for that individual. Now, the thing is, they are not mutually uh, exclusive. Now, in borderline personality disorder, usually the person is better able to read social cues. In autism, uh, the person enjoys and seeks at times solitude, sensory sensitivity, have passions and interests and difficulty coping with change and transitions. So similarities and differences, but the main thing is they benefit from the same treatment dialectical behavior therapy. DBT had uh, a number of issues with regard to what conventional therapies will work. Dialectical behavior therapy was designed for BPD. We now know it is very effective in autism. Wow, that's great news. That's very positive. <laughs> All right, next is about shutdowns. What is the shutdown? Dr. Tony, could you please talk about the shutdown again? You mentioned it in Ask Dr. Tony, February 2022, but you quickly mentioned selective. I hate that term. There's nothing selective about it for me. 
and then you switched directly into demand avoidance. Also, I haven't been officially diagnosed, but the more I hear and read about autism, I'm convinced that I am autistic. And this video pretty much cemented my belief that this is indeed the case. And at 55 years of age, that's pretty mind-blowing. It is. Uh, better late than never. Now, my apologies. Um, as Craig said, we've been doing uh, Ask Dr. T for so many years that in that time, knowledge changes. And that's where we seek clarification. Now, shutdown uh, may be explained as due to high levels of anxiety and a human reaction, actually an animal reaction too, of high levels of anxiety is going to be flight to escape, fight to deal with the situation for survival, and freeze. Now, I'm increasingly aware that there is something about autistic anxiety that is different from conventional anxiety. The depth and um, duration of that anxiety seems much greater. If I had a solution for autism, it would be to alleviate the anxiety. Unfortunately, some find drugs as a way, illegal drugs, of alleviating high levels of anxiety. Now, one of the reactions is freeze. And I agree, it's not really selective. The person doesn't choose it. I think the better term is situational mutism. So in situations that are the focus of the tension, they are very anxious, they really can't do things, they can't talk. It is situational mutism. But we're exploring another characteristic called demand avoidance or pathological demand avoidance, where the person uh, refuses to comply with simple requests. And it may be that an explanation for some of these may be the freeze reaction. And this is where afterwards you ask the person, you, I asked you to clean your teeth and, and you refused uh, or put your socks on. And sometimes they'll say, yes, I know how to do it but I can't do it. I can't do it. it. And this is a situation where it is not necessarily deliberately non-complying. They actually can't make the movement. They are frozen in a way. So please, uh, for this person, read more about uh, autistic women. Uh, there are a number of books published by Jessica Kingsley Publishers, which will help explore that further. But I am now much preferring to use the term situational mutism, and it's associated with extraordinarily intense autistic anxiety. Mm -hmm. Good term, good update. Mm. Next is, what is the difference between hyperfocus and autistic monotropism? What's the difference? Um, they're different words, I think, for the same phenomenon uh, in a way. Monotropism is a theory that's being explored further in the research literature. And I'm delighted that this has come from many autistic individuals describing their life and now seeking and achieving research to confirm that. I think the terms hyperfocus and autistic monotropism are actually synonymous as far as I know so far. Now, what is monotropism? Um, it's conceptualizing the mind as an interest system. And what happens is uh, an individual's interests guide their allocation of attention. Now, what seems to be occurring in autism and, and monotropism is, a, shall we say, um, a development of a one-track mind. Um, when Lawson has explained this is a little bit like going into a completely darkened room and you have a pencil uh, being taught, and you can see a chair, you can see a television, you can see uh, another chair. Um, but you tend to see them in isolation. But the thing is, a non-autistic person, it's like switching a main light on, and you can see all of those components. Now, what may be occurring in autism is you have that narrow but very intense focus that's occurring. And there's a difficulty then reorientating attention, switching tasks, but also processing multiple channels. 
And that's what happens socially, is you have um, eye movements, uh, you have facial expressions, you have gestures, you have context and so on. And often the autistic person says, I can't, it, I can't cope. I'm just overwhelmed. It is too much. I, I can see your eyes, but then I can't hear what you're saying or I can hear what you're saying, but I can't look at your eyes. There's too much uh, information. Now, this year, there's been the development of the monotropism questionnaire by Garo et al. G A R A U. So, if you want to know more information about that, this is the the study and the questionnaire that you can explore more. At this stage, it is a theoretical model that is being evaluated, but it's one that teachers and autistic individuals need to be aware of. The next is what is the difference between stoicism and ASD? Dr. Tony, what do you make of the philosophy of Stoicism as being useful in helping those with ASD and others understand and be comfortable with themselves? Hmm. Another good question. Uh, psychology is founded in philosophy. Uh, that's the, the, to a certain extent, the, the, obviously, the, the Greek and the Roman philosophers. And when you go back, um, Stoicism is uh, practicing certain virtues in everyday life, such as courage, temperance, and living in accordance with nature. And I immediately think of autism, of the courage of going to school in social situations, of temperance, trying to modulate and regulate intense emotions, but also living in accordance with Nature, and often the autistic person feels really relaxed, comfortable, and at ease when they're in nature. Um, but part of stoicism is being emotionally resilient to misfortune. In other words, not catastrophizing. Now, stoicism teaches the development of self-control and fortitude to overcome destructive emotions. And what's interesting, Cognitive behavior therapy was originally founded on aspects of stoicism. So stoicism is beneficial in encouraging a pathway to self-acceptance, regulation, and so on. So if you are interested in um, the Greek philosophers, I think stoicism might be something for an autistic individual to explore. I think that many autistic individuals, especially autistic teenagers, are natural philosophers. They go through an existential angst, John Paul Sartre, who am I, what's the meaning of life? And they will analyze in a philosophical sense at a much deeper and more prolonged level than other teenagers. And they find a fascination with reading the old philosophers. I would say that can be the basis then of a personal philosophy. Yeah, and discovery. Mm. This is great. Be the change you want to see. Hello, Dr. Tony. I'm a student and I actually have a high IQ, but I failed at school. I've been an outsider all my life and my classmates don't care about me. So I started skipping lessons and failed courses. Now I'm older and I regret having done that. But because of that, people believe I'm stupid and thus failed. And I'm still an outsider. Do you have any tips for me? Oh, I have some tips, but an analysis to begin with. I'm wondering if your failure may be due to a combination of autism, the social issues, but especially ADHD. Now, the social and group learning would have been difficult at school because of the autism. And attention, regulation, and executive functioning, that is planning, organizing, prioritization, time management, distraction, keeping to deadlines, that's the ADHD difficulties, may explain why you are lacking success at school. Many of those with ADHD are terrible underachievers. So you had a double whammy. You have both the autism and I strongly suspect ADHD. And you say you have a, a high IQ. So in other words, you know you're smart and you should have been more successful. That means it's getting your act together to be successful in an academic second, uh, setting. So I do recommend for this person uh, who's a student 
seeking an assessment for and if confirmed treatment for ADHD because then if you can organize plan get it all together you can go yeah and when you do graduate <laughs> you can say yes I'm not stupid yes good luck to that student mm. next is encouraging another's change that you would like to see hello I suspect that my husband of 25 years has Asperger's and probably my son also my son is easier to get along with. He has a good career and he lives alone. He's 27 and he manages really well and spends most of his free time playing games. He socializes a little. My husband is a problem. Our relationship is difficult. He's a scientist and he's mad about model airplanes and the TV. He doesn't have friends. He works from home on a laptop all day, but lots of connections with colleagues and customers. He disconnects from me, he doesn't understand what's needed in a relationship, and he's a bit like Dr. Tony's example, Italian drivers. He's over-enthusiastic at times, and sometimes displays inappropriate behaviors. And he has to be told multiple times what to do and how to act. He doesn't even know the color of my eyes, until I told him a year ago. And they're green, by the way. <laughs> He's not interested in Asperger's, and he's certainly not interested in having a diagnosis. But I am at the end of my tether, and I need some support. What can I do? And are there spouse support groups in the UK? Oh, we are going through some um, quite diverse aspects of, of autism. Now, in uh, reading this description and compassion for her situation, one of her major difficulties is that she may recognize autism in her partner, but he is not prepared to accept that. That means that he may not be prepared to accept relationship counseling based on the characteristics of autism. But this particular person needs more information. Now, I'm a strong supporter of Jessica Kingsley Publishers, and uh, Craig, they published our books uh, yes. and so on. Now, um, there's a book called Neurodiverse relationships published by JKP uh, written by Joanna Pike and a number of uh, couples and I have a contribution to that book so I would go to jkp.com and also have a look at the books by Maxine Aston because that can give you some um, validation and affirmation so you don't feel so lonely of the challenges that you face secondly uh, again, with my friend and colleague, Michelle Garnett, we've developed what's called atwoodandgarnettevents.com. Now, we did a whole day webcast called Autism in Couple Relationships, and you can watch it on your own, get the information, and if need be, you can ask your husband to watch with you, or if he doesn't want to do a six-hour <laughs> webcast, because you, you have it for 60 days, you can take as long as you like, you can show that person um, particular components of the explanations and strategies, but it's done in private and it might, shall we say, plant a seed of help. If he doesn't want to go to a relationship counsellor, the books by jkp.com may help. Now, if you're looking for support groups, you can contact the National Autistic Society in London. Now, there was a support group. In fact, I think one of the world's first support groups were started in the UK. Tended to be certain key individuals who are the driving force, they become exhausted and I think it, it, it then collapsed. But I do recommend um, on Facebook, different together. Uh, and also that's, um, should we say, run by Joanna Stevenson who actually provides relationship counselling. So you may look at relationship counselling just for you to help you understand and cope with the situation. Mm -hmm. You and Michelle continue to contribute such great curriculum and thank you for that. Thank you. Next is help with sleep. Do you have some advice for Aspies who struggle with sleep? I wake up about four to five times a night and I feel very awake and tired at the same time. I also feel very stressed. I'm 34, female, and have struggled with this for years. I'm feeling at the edge of my power. Mm. 
there is something about autism and sleep. In fact, when we look at early diagnosis for very young children, if not infants, uh, one of the things that parents will say in reply to the question, were there any characteristics of your now no autistic son or daughter that was there from the beginning that was concerned but you didn't think autism and that's sleep now that is either a lack of sleep or they're like a koala and they sleep about 20 hours a day um you can get the two extremes in that but it's usually um shall we say great difficulty getting to sleep staying asleep the quality of sleep and the duration of sleep and the majority of autistic individuals are chronically sleep deprived. Research suggests that, and clinical experience confirms, uh, between 40 and 80% of autistic children and adults have sleep problems. It's not in the diagnostic criteria, but it's very, very common. Now, once again, Michelle Garnet and I, in Atwood and Garnet events, recognize this problem, and we have a webinar, three hour webinar on autism and sleep. And if you go to my webpage, tonyatwood.com.au, there's actually a blog on autism and sleep for more information. Now, the research clinical experience confirms the problems that can occur. But for this particular person, it seems a waking four or five times a night. Now, actually, you do wake four or five times a night, but you don't remember it. You, just, you, you rise uh, and down. What can occur in autism are two things. One is you may wake and be more awake because of sensory sensitivity. There is a sound, there is a sensory experience that rouses you, shall we say. But the other is it's then the ability to switch back into sleep. And that may be an issue that's occurring. So I do recommend referral to a sleep clinic. This is really affecting your quality of life. Um, it's possible to look at a sleep questionnaire. You can download quite a few off the internet. If you're going to a physician, take that information uh, along with you. They will deal with what, it's strange word, sleep hygiene. That, that's not yeah. having a shower before you go to bed. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's how well you have a, a amount of daylight in the day, your uh, circadian, that is, uh, rhythm that's occurring and so on. But another factor is sleep issues can be associated with depression. So there may be a screening, is depression a factor in that? Why autistic individuals have problems with sleep? It may be a mixture of sensory sensitivity. Yes, it could be depression for some, but it may be something that is biologically within autism that makes the sleep switch elusive to fall asleep and to go back to sleep when you've woken in the night. Sleep is an issue. Mm. Last question for this episode is, I need hope. Do you have any new information on gender dysphoria? Not what it is, but how can I, as a transsexual, male to female, Aspie, live in this world? I have a significant other online. They are more bisexual but we communicate well, and I trust them. Maybe someday we can actually meet in person. It's just that at 29, disabled, I spend most of my time online. What's to live for? Yes, I do get depressed, but not now writing this. I genuinely want to know what good am I to the world, if any. Ooh, what good you are to the world depends on your abilities and personality. I'll go through that first. Now, autism is associated with specific abilities such as knowledge and expertise in their chosen area of passion or interest. Attention to detail, determination, problem solving, identifying patterns and errors, creativity in the arts and languages, compassion and the caring professions, honesty, integrity, etc. So those characteristics are there within you. And it's uh, exploring that probably with someone else mm -hmm. as to what may be a career for you that uses those strengths that you have. Um, now, if you feel depressed, 
I, I would recommend the book that Michelle Garnett and I wrote called Exploring Depression and Beating the Blues, published by Jessica Kingsley Publishers again. It's a self-help manual. You can go through that yourself with someone to guide you. And on that topic of, of someone to guide you, your circumstances are, uh, should we say, uh, not only the uh, transition uh, male to female, but also the dimension of autism. So you may seek a mentor, an autistic person who's been down the same path. And I really would like uh, services for those who have gender dysphoria and transition to meet up with a buddy, someone who, uh, should we say, can give you an objectivity, can give you empathy for your situation and support you. You seem to be very lonely and you may need someone who's been down the same path. Um, so also you can look at as a transsexual yourself, you may be able to help other autistic individuals on the same journey. So you have value that way. Wow. Dr. Tony, as always, thank you for your knowledgeable responses, but thank you for your compassion, uh, being able to provide hope. Uh, it's not hopeless. Remember, each of us can contribute something. So we're at the end of the question list, Dr. Tony. As always, it's just fun to see you again. I look forward to the next time we get a chance to tackle some of these issues. Yes, and, and I don't know whether you want to include this, but uh, Craig and I are virtually the same age. So, so we're mates, we're friends. Here. True. So we, we, we talk about the aging process and so on. So before the recording is made, we have a bit of a chat. Okay, did you want to tell them about that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to. You had a lovely phrase that you said that uh, people of our age, when they start talking, they have an organ recital and <laughs> talking about the various organs that are, that are decaying. If you meet up with a friend you haven't seen for a while, the first five minutes are always the organ recital. How are you doing yes. and how are things working? Anyway, yes. That's enough of that. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Tony, and thank you, everybody. We'll see you again next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Ha, 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 ha.